started. Hello, everyone, and welcome. I am Dr. Rhoda Bernard, the Managing Director of the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education, and Special Needs. And this is the Berkeley Music Education and Special Needs Study Group. We are now in session five. This is level one, session five of our 2021 offering. Um, and you are in for such a treat today. My dear partner in crime, Victoria Lariccio, will be spending our time with us working on differentiated instruction and behavioral teaching and behavior management. Before we get to her sessions, I'm going to just walk you through the logistics that we've been talking about. If you've been coming to all of these and watching all of these videos, this is not new information, but just so we all are always on the same logistical page. Right, so we're gonna skip over the slides about me and my program because you already have seen all that and get right to our logistics. So this is our synchronous session schedule. Um, and as you can see, today is Saturday, May 1st, and we are here at level one with Victoria Lariccia. Um, later today from one to 4 p.m., we will have Krista Yadro working on music learning theory and how we use that with students with disabilities. Krista works with young students, but she is going to make sure that the material that she presents is applicable to students of all ages. And then I'm going to do a session on special education, evidence-based strategies that map really well onto music education. So we'll talk about that this afternoon. And then two weeks from now comes our very last set of sessions. It's kind of amazing. Here we are coming towards the end. And that will be all about you and your projects. And Vicki will be back. And she and I will be offering feedback to you on your projects. So as you know, on Monday, the video recordings from today will be sent out to you, as well as all of the slides and resources and the links to the Between Session Engagement Google Documents so that you've got everything you need. Um, so if you are going to participate in full participation status in the study group, you need to do the following things. 18 hours of sessions. Those 18 hours can be all level one, can be all level two, can be a mixture of both. You can do more than 18 hours. 18 is your minimum. Those 18 can be synchronous or asynchronous or a combination of both. We just need 18 hours of participation. You also need to do the between session engagement Google document work between every session. Those are always sent out in links the Monday after the session weekend. So we'll be looking and tracking participation through those documents. And then finally, you need to create and present a study group project. We're gonna do multiple shifts of sending out certificate particip of participation. So right after we wrap in a couple of weeks, shortly thereafter, we will send out the certificates of participation to everyone who's done their work by that time. But we know that there are some asynchronous participants who are lagging behind a bit in terms of getting it all done. And so we'll do a second shift and probably a third shift of sending out those certificates so that all of you who earn those certificates receive them. So what is a project? We've been talking about this since day one, but it is a personal application of some aspect of what you learn in this study group to your own situation. It can take a wide variety of forms. We consider projects to be works in progress. We are spending 12 weeks together. It is impossible to create, test, uh, modify, perfect, and tie a beautiful bow on something in 12 weeks. And we know this. So it's really about, this is this thing I'm exploring, and here's where I am today, right? It's a snapshot. And depending on what your project is, the deliverable is going to look differently. If you're working on a curriculum project, you're probably going to create curricular materials. If you're looking at a case study of an individual student, you're going to share that in a different way, right? So we're going to be providing feedback to those projects. And one addendum to this, it says here that the presentations are to be under 10 minutes. We've talked about this before. We have more projects than we anticipated. So we're gonna look at under five minutes for you to present. So please do not plan 
a long presentation because you know the awful feeling as educators of having to stop your students in the middle. And I'm gonna have to do it because we wanna get airtime for as many people as possible. So plan something short. So you might've done a whole lot of things that would take 10 minutes to tell us, give us the highlights. Say, here's what I did, here's a highlight, bada boom. And then we'll have the materials for the whole thing. Uh, that's the way we're going to have to do it. It's a great problem to have, right? We have three hours in the morning and three hours in the afternoon to get through them. And I'm excited about it. And I want to make sure that as many projects can get publicly heard as possible. You all know what this is like as educators, the, the endless juggle of time. So help us by planning something short. A short presentation doesn't mean a less meaningful project. It just means we've got so many. And so you'll give us a short highlight. Um, so Vicki and I will then give you feedback on those. And as I've said before, I will have, and I'll send this with the big push that comes out on Monday, um, I'll set up a Google Drive folder for folks who are asynchronous participants who can't make it to one of the two times on Monday, uh, on Monday, on May 15th. Um, if you can't make it to one of those two times on May 15th, but you wanna share your project, There'll be a folder for you to put it in and I will make sure your project gets shared. So we will have that available to you on Monday. Um, so start thinking about it now, if you haven't been already, we have that Google doc where people are putting in their ideas. We know these ideas shift and change over time. You are not required to update the Google doc. The Google doc was a place for you to put your thinking and get a little feedback from me. Um, so I'm not going to take questions on this because we've been talking about projects forever. I feel like we're in a good place on projects, but I wanted to go over the logistics um, of how things work. So I am going to stop my share and turn today's uh, events over to Victoria Lariccia. Uh, I imagine Vicki will introduce herself to you, but I just want to speak on a personal level that um, Vicki and I have been working together for a long time now. It's like 14 or 15 years, which is kind of amazing. Um, and she is one of my most cherished friends and colleagues, someone with whom um, we have blazed so many exciting new trails together in the work we do in our arts education programs at Berkeley. Vicki also teaches two courses for us in the graduate programs in music education and autism um, and has legions of former grad students and current grad students who adore her. I'm now teaching a couple of classes with students who had Vicki last summer and they're always bringing in connections to what they learned with her. Um, she is a remarkable practitioner, but so generous in what she has to give to her young students and to educators everywhere. So you're in for a huge treat this morning, and I will turn it over to my dear Vicki Lavicia. Thank you for that introduction, Rhoda. That was so sweet. <laughs> um, so full disclosure, I am not a classically trained musician in any way. I am a musician self-taught, grew up in a very musical household. And throughout my years as an educator, I was able to apply what I know about music and support students with disabilities in their music classrooms. Currently, right now at this moment, I am a special education teacher. I have a learning center for students in grades seventh and eighth grade. And the range of disabilities is, is it's a range and it's mostly moderate disabilities. Um, so, without further ado, I will begin our first presentation on differentiated instruction. <laughs> okay, so in this presentation, we're going to talk about what is differentiation, the elements and characteristics of a differentiated cl classroom, the difference between inclusion and substantially separate instruction. And then I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Kahoot, but I hope we have time to play that game at the end. I'm look, aiming to end around 11. So here we have a Venn diagram that shows different practices you can use to support the range of students you have in your classroom. And there's just so much diversity in so many ways. And we can't 
teach just one way to meet the needs of all of our different students. So you, you may have heard about UDL or Universal Design for Learning. So there was a session on Universal Design for Learning earlier in the study group. So they spent time with Rhiannon over video and also had another session with two other folks. Amazing, UDL is wonderful. Um, and the principles of UDL have some overlap with differentiated instruction. So you're gonna see some commonalities. And also for students that are on IEPs, the accommodations and modifications within the IEP support those students. And there's also something called a DCAP or an ICAP that a lot of people aren't really aware of. It's the District Curriculum Accommodation Plan. And ICAP is an individualized curriculum accommodation plan. So that isn't special education. Those are just accommodations that can be given to students that need some extra support in some way, but they don't necessarily have goals or they don't need services provided by a special education teacher or service provider. There's also the 504, which is the legal version of a, an accommodation plan. Um, so that would support varied students. And then there's differentiation and which we're gonna talk about today. So all three of these areas combined, hopefully will meet the needs of all of your students. All right, so here we're just gonna start with this video that gives a very nice animated overview of differentiated instruction. I'm Larry Ferlazzo, differentiating instruction. To some educators, it conjures visions of having to create a different lesson for every student in the room and long nights of planning and grading. That insanity is not what differentiation is all about. Differentiating instruction is really a way of thinking, not a pre-planned list of strategies. Oftentimes, it is making decisions in the moment based on this mindset. It's recognizing that, to paraphrase Rick Wormley, fair doesn't always mean treating everyone equally. It's recognizing that all of our students bring different gifts and challenges, and that as educators, we need to recognize those differences and use our professional judgment to flexibly respond to them in our teaching. Carol Tomlinson talks about the ability to differentiate in three areas, content, process, and product. For content, student choice is one way we might differentiate, like allowing students to choose their research topics or essay prompts. As teachers, we need to keep our eyes on the prize. In other words, we have to keep asking ourselves, what are the main learning objectives? One day, my students were writing an argument essay about what would be the worst natural disaster to experience. John's head was down on the desk. He was not doing anything. I knew that he was interested in football, so I told him that he could write an essay on why his favorite team was the best. He would still have to make an argument just about football instead of hurricanes or earthquakes. His eyes lit up. He got to work and wrote what his mother later told me was the first essay he had ever written in school. He had followed all the guidelines of a good argument essay. The prize in this case was learning to write an argument essay, not learning to write about natural disasters. To differentiate by process, teachers can change up how they group students. Sometimes a mixed ability group might work best, while sometimes it might be appropriate to have same ability groups. We might have an English proficient buddy work with an English language learner to help them out. During independent reading time in my early morning class several years ago, one student tended to fall asleep. I told him that if he wanted, he could go to the back and sit on a desk and read. Soon, several others joined him. A few days later, I saw another student dozing off. Before I could say anything, one of his classmates whispered to him, just go sit on a desk. Again, it's a matter of keeping our eyes on the prize. What are the learning objectives and what are the best roads to get there for different students? Teachers can also differentiate by the type of product students create. The major demonstration of learning doesn't always have to be an essay or a multiple choice test. One year I had a student who liked to doodle when other students or I were talking. I told her it was okay as long as she was doodling about the information we were discussing. She built on those doodles to create a final project that brilliantly and visually represented all the key points we had covered. When I give tests, 
I often give students an extra blank page where they can write anything else they remember about the topic being tested that they think is important. I often find the quality of thinking and writing better there than in response to my test questions. None of the differentiating strategies I've mentioned have created any extra work for me. They did require that I had relationships with my students to know their strengths, challenges, and interests. And I needed to demonstrate flexibility in my thinking. Making these strategies successful also required building a strong class culture so that some of the students were being treated differently and they understood why. And they understood that that was the only way to be truly fair. The ideas mentioned here are just a drop in the bucket. There are a zillion other ways we can support our students' gifts and challenges. We just need to keep our minds and ears open. All right, and we are actually gonna use Tomlinson's structure that explains differentiated instruction now. Okay. So two, two pieces here. What is differentiation? So it recognizes that students vary in a bunch of different ways. So we've got background knowledge, what they know about your class before starting, readiness, language, preferences, interactions, and responses to instruction. So I'm gonna um, open up the chat here. And what's missing from this list? How, what are some other ways that students vary from each other? They are not all the same. Preferred ways of communication. Yeah. There's actually like an infinite, there's infinite answers to this question. I'm just curious what people think. How are our students different from one another? So you can put your response in the chat. Culture, focus, yeah, great. In my world as a special educator, there are so many places where students vary within the world of ability. Oh yeah, here we go. Abilities, language proficiency, cultures, interests and connections to the subject, different perceptions of what is taught, expectations they have for themselves, home life is such a huge piece we need to take into consideration. Um, I work in a district that is predominantly an affluent district, but we have such a disparity with uh, socioeconomic status. And some, sometimes I have to remind my, my colleagues, like, well, some of my students don't have access to tutors or their families, aren't, their parents aren't home to support them because they're working late at night. Um, and it's so important to recognize those differences in our students. Um, we have interest in subject area, how likely they are to share with what they know versus peer perceptions. Great. So yeah, that's something that we all need to kind of keep in mind, like what is different about our students? And this list is not um, full, a full list. So there, are, so the word variety comes up a lot with differentiation. So as a teacher, you want to have a variety of ways to explore the curriculum content, sense-making activities through which students can construct their knowledge and options for students to demonstrate what they've learned. And I mean, this, is, this might be obvious, but the reason we wanna use a variety is because our students are so varied. If we're only teaching in one way or teaching the way we like to be taught, then we're only going to reach the students that are like us. And that is not, uh, providing access to your content for all students. A level of social interaction they're willing to engage in was something else um, participant put in the chat. 
So referring back to Tomlinson, she talks about three elements of your lessons that can be differentiated. So the content, the what that you're teaching, you want to focus on concepts, principles, and skills. You don't just want to teach, you know, if you have a curriculum or a, a textbook, which you probably don't, but you don't just want to teach using that traditional method. A hallmark component of differentiation is this process piece, flexible groupings, multiple modalities, student choice, calls on students to think at a high level. So when, when I like think about differentiation, I think about how do I group my students in ways for them to work together on whatever it is, whatever concept I'm trying to teach them. Um, and, and then that product that students create, I have Dora the Explorer here because a huge piece in the product and how you assess students is setting up your classroom so that they are the ones kind of teaching themselves and exploring the content. And it creates this level of ownership and challenge. Um, and the students get to select certain tasks and they feel excited, more excited about that rather than only giving them one way to demonstrate what they know, they have a piece in, in deciding. So this comes from one of Tomlinson's texts, um, how to differentiate in mixed ability classrooms. So she just kind of breaks down the steps for making, um, for as a teacher creating a powerful product assignment. Like how will you assess the student throughout the unit or at the very end? And so here she has the first, you wanna identify the essentials. So that in the video, when the, um, the guy was talking about keeping your eyes on the prize, what are the objectives here? What do I really want the student to demonstrate what they know? And then number two, identify one or more formats. So, you know, in, in an arts class, there's so many ways that you could uh, decide on a format. Determine expectations for quality. So, you know, you want to have some sort of a rubric or way that you're going to assess the student. And so they know what the expectations are. So here, there are the three characteristics, again, the content process and product. Number four, decide on scaffolding. So scaffolding is such a huge um, term in special education, but it essentially just means supports along the way. Um, so she gives a few ideas here. Develop a product assignment that clearly says to the student, like, this is what I want you to get out of this. You should show that you understand this. Um, and six, this is also huge in the world of special education and in, in all classes, modifying the assignment. So maybe you wanna make some changes based on readiness, interest, learning profile, and the other uh, areas that students vary that we talked about earlier. And then coach for success, provide support along the way so this, your students can be successful. Okay, and then this, I'm not gonna read all of this, but please, um, can someone say in the chat if they can read that? I know it's like really small looking. Go into full screen. Yes, okay. Yeah, so not all of these are gonna apply to your class and I hope I didn't make this clear, but this is just the general overview of differentiation, differentiated instruction. It's not, there are some like music elements to it, um, but I hope that you can find something here that applies to your classroom. So there is, this is a very long list of product possibilities. How can you assess what students know? And maybe some students might gravitate towards specific possibilities here. Um, I guess I'll open it up in the chat. Are there any here that you were like, oh, I, I might try that in my classroom. That might, that might work. Or um, I never thought of that before. I'll just give you a minute or two to, to share. The puppet show one is always like the one that people are like, oh my God, that's so funny. I think I might do that. I 
can ask another question too. Are there any here that you have done to assess your students? So Krista says, I just did create an instrument with third grade and I'm about to have fourth graders write a rap. They choose their own topic form and used varied beat maker. That's awesome. Very differentiated, lots of choices. Yeah, if there's one that you've done yourself that's not on here, please share. Choreographed dances, love it. Just give a few more seconds. I'm gonna move us up. <laughs> Chat. Self-organized musical play production. Photo essay sounds interesting. Yeah, there's so much technology now that came out of the pandemic. I feel like creating videos and it, there's just so many possibilities for students in that area. And they're so much more proficient with technology than adults. <laughs> When I returned to school, my third year seniors wrote <clears throat> a short musical, COVID the musical, oh my God, I'm so curious about that. And it's so relevant to what they're going through. I'm assuming that they all have the same background knowledge on that, so that, that works. I might have missed it, but I have been doing news reports. Nice. All right, I'm gonna move us along. So, oh, we got another chat, I don't wanna miss people. I also had a student build his ukulele, write instructions and teach a friend. Oh my gosh, I love that. Invent a way to sing, say a certain word with children ages five to six. And the, the ukulele example is interesting because that, um, and we'll talk about this a little later, when you differentiate across, you know, ability or understanding, you want to also reach the students who are the either gifted or the, the high achievers. And so by having the student build his ukulele, I'm, I'm making an assumption that they, you know, or might be a high achiever because that seems like a huge task. Um, but then empowering that student to teach someone else is, is differentiated. That's excellent. <clears throat> okay, so those are the three elements, content, process, product. But then there's four characteristics from Tomlinson. So, oh, that's so cool. They come pre-cut on Amazon, the ukulele. Nice. Love it. Okay. So when you're thinking about instruction, like I was saying before, you don't want to just cover material. And I think with, I mean, I teach in middle school and I know with my middle school colleagues and I'm assuming in high school, Sometimes as teachers, we feel kind of anxious to get the, we have to like go through the standards, right? Um, we have to get things done within a certain amount of time. So sometimes we kind of lose focus on, well, what's the end goal here? You know, we, we don't need to just blow through the content and say we did it. Um, but we want to make sure that students are able to access what you're teaching. So again, setting up opportunities for them to explore the content on their own and work together and then apply what they've learned, solidify their learning. The second one is assessment, which, which lines up with product. So the assessment piece is ongoing. We're always assessing students. Some assessments are more summative, some are more formative, um, some are informal, some are formal. So, you know, the most basic form of assessment is just observation. You're just observing the students and taking notes on how they're doing. Um, but the point of assessment is to provide feedback to you as a teacher. So then you can move forward and decide, okay, what is the student, what are my students struggling with? How can I support them? I'm a flexible teacher because I do differentiated instruction. So what can I change now moving forward? to make sure that they can access. Um, and then for students that need a little deeper 
um, understanding and they need to go even further, you want to think about our gifted and high achievers um, extending the exploration, not just giving them extra work to fill up the time. So down here on the bottom right, this is an extension menu, which if we have time later, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But this is, um, an if we were in person, I'd have you make your own. Um, but this is a really cool way to provide an opportunity for exploration and, and ownership over the product that students are creating. And if they're, if they're at that level, they can select from this menu, which again, it's really small and we'll go over it later. Um, and again, we talked about the process of differentiated instruction, but students work in a variety of patterns. So sometimes they might work alone, sometimes they might work with a buddy, and sometimes they might work with a group. And it's up to you if you want those groups to be homogenous, so they're, they're similar in some way, um, or heterogeneous where they're very different in some ways. So there's like arguments for both being good depending on the situation. So heterogeneous is really great um, if you think about ability because there is some research that shows students who are struggling who are grouped with students that aren't struggling tend to gravitate towards like learning from the students that aren't struggling as much and working together. And the students that aren't struggling as much try to support the students that are struggling. So it becomes this like really nice dichotomy. And sometimes that's not so great because if the students that are like gifted or high achievers, um, they can sometimes become frustrated with students who have a slower processing speed or maybe they struggle with comprehension. Um, so you want to just be mindful about the dynamics in your classroom and how students connect and relate to each other when you're creating groups and what your end goal is. Um, does anyone here have a strategy for how they group students? Because it's, it's not a science. Um, <clears throat> and like, I feel like when I do it and when my colleagues do it, they'll like kind of learn from the mistake. Well, th those two students don't work so well together. I'm gonna to make sure I don't group them next time. You can use the chat. Um, the question is just, do you have a strategy for how you group students or do you have, like, do you prefer heterogeneous grouping over homogeneous grouping? Or what kind of, uh, what kind of factors do you take into consideration when you group students? Uh, we have flexible depending on activity in class. So I'm assuming that means that it changes in that the, the activity you're doing kind of lends itself to that. Just give like 10 more seconds. Uh, we have, I let kids pick partners. If there is a behavior problem, I tell them I will have to split them up if they're not staying on task. That usually works well and they maintain better focus because they want to work with their friend. And then we also have, I think that it is a little difficult when the times you see them are further apart. Yes, this is, I, we talk about this a lot in this group. Um, I start out random, oops, I start out random groupings and then I regroup them as I figure out who works well together. So you kind of assess based on the first groupings, yeah. Um, it, it's definitely trial and error with specific students. I teach K to five and autism class classes mainstream into the room. Some students are able to fully jump in and others stay with a paraprofessional when needed. Think about leadership skills. Some groups need a strong leaders, but sometimes you need to make a group without a leader to grow the leadership qualities of the other students. I agree, actually, uh, Alyssa wrote that. I, I have a student who, when he, goes into a heterogeneous group, um, he takes a back seat because the other students have higher leadership skills. And so I was collaborating with his teacher 
about that. And I said, I think the next time you group the student, like, I think it actually needs to be more um, homogenous. Like he needs to be more with students like him or he needs to be with students that he can support. So he becomes, um, he takes initiative over, over the group, um, definitely. The only thing I would caution about letting kids pick partners um, is for students who struggle with social skills, who maybe they don't know who to pick and they're always picked last, that they kind of become invisible sometimes. So um, you might have a class where that doesn't happen. Like everyone like has someone they always wanna pick, but um, just I just caution about that pattern of kids picking their own partners and not doing it all the time. Um, I like the I like the orchestra or ensemble approach. Everyone involved in some capacity. Sometimes it means breaking up into groups and then bringing them together. Uh, with I'm with small class sizes at the moment. And then we'll take this last comment here. I have the same class daily for a period of a month. Oh, interesting. So that frequency allows my students to achieve better because we meet frequently. I love that model. Yeah, and my I work in a K to eight school. And we um, like we call it conservatory in the middle school. So there's like a bunch of different conservatory classes you can take, um, and they only meet twice a week. And during the pandemic, they were only meeting we're only meeting once a week right now. When we go back to uh, school in September, it'll be back to twice a week. And art has always been once a week, which is uh, there's just not enough time in the day. <laughs> it's it's not good. Um, it's just once a week. So it's hard to do a lot of a lot of the stuff when you don't see them that often. But I love this model that Katerina is talking about. Okay. And then the fourth characteristic, which I love, and this kind of gets back to the video. If you're differentiating properly, you shouldn't have to do a ton of work. Essentially, you're setting up the class, you're creating a structure so that they teach themselves in a way. And I have Dora the Explorer in, on some of these slides because they're going out into the world exploring and, and you're just the facilitator. You're just checking in and making sure they're on the right track. You're the guide. <laughs> That's the constructivist approach. Um, and because the students are the ones teaching themselves, they are owning their learning. And that actually really helps with memory. A lot of my students have memory struggles. Um, if they're the ones diving into the, the, skill, the skill building and the content learning, they're more likely to remember it rather than having to, like, like what I'm doing right now is not differentiated at all. And like, this is gonna be harder for people to remember because they're not part of um, the learning. You're kind of just so, um, soaking it up. <laughs> Okay, so here is another video. Um, this is a, a band teacher. I believe she teaches middle school or high school and she explains how she differentiates her class. Um, so as you're watching it, there's some questions down here that I'll, I'll ask you in the chat at the end. What differentiated instruction strategies does she mention that we've kind of talked about? And what strategies did she not mention that you think might be good for her music class? Um, one other thing that's a little bit annoying for anyone who has sensory issues, there's this like wicker table that she has these pieces of paper on and she like slides them across and it makes a very loud sound. So I apologize for that. All right. Hello and welcome. This is differentiated instruction in the modern music classroom. I'll be your teacher today. I'm Allison McKay. I'm the Data Middle School Instrumental Music Instructor and your artist of the evening. First, I wanted to talk to you about getting to know your students. This is our student, and I found that getting to know them helps to let you know how to better instruct them. For example, a lot of my students are involved in the Boy Scouts. These students make really good leaders. I've also found that dancers and other performers are really good at practicing and learning their skills quickly and they have the discipline to continue working but sometimes they can't make it to the performance because they're doing other things. 
A lot of students are involved in sports and they are also very dedicated. It's also really good to know which of your students have little students coming in behind them. This can distract them at home. It can make them frustrated that they're not getting the right amount of attention from their parents, but future trombone players who so keep them coming. The purpose of differentiating instruction is so that this student, along with all of these students, get the same amount of education in my classroom. What we want is to move our students across their zone of proximal development. Here is what the student can do unaided, and that's without me. Miss McKay is the teacher. Here's what the learner can do with guidance. That's where I come into play. Here, we're not there yet. We're focusing right here. We're gonna move them up through what they can do unaided to what they can do with our help. Ways I like to do this in my classroom are to give my students options on their questions. These are the depth of knowledge questions. So I'll ask my student, what is the time signature of this piece? This is a level one. If I want them to think a little bit more, I'll give them a level two. What bow stroke would be best to achieve this accent? I can ask them something a little more deeper, like what do you think inspired the composer for this piece? Or if I want them to really look into the music, I'll ask them to create a program notes for our upcoming concert. This is like a research paper for our students. I found that grouping students the traditional way in our orchestra, like so, with a teacher up front, these dots are students, the teacher up front, the sections the way they are, I found it really hard to get to all my students, especially the bases right here in the back. When they're grouped like this in the traditional sense, they can only work with each other. But what I tried to do is put them in rows like this. So the basses are all together, but the cellos can hear them and the violins can hear them. And that leaves lots of room for Miss McKay to wander the rows here to fix this student's and this student's and this student's problems that they've been forming. We offer our students at Data Middle School options in what they want to perform. They're able to join the band class and the orchestra class. And this gets every personality type of student an option for how they want to learn music. Also, what's really important is to let the students know that they can be assessed in different ways as well. I like to listen to hear if the student is playing the right notes. This is an easy way to do an assessment in my classroom. Another way I like to assess is by giving them an exit slip. If they understand the content, they let me know. Sometimes, unfortunately, I have to give the student a test. And this can be either a playing test or a written test. And that is a nice assessment to hear whether he knows what he's talking about when he's playing his cello. I give my students practice cards and I taught them a bunch of different ways to practice and they tell me how much they practice each week. And my favorite one is the choose your adventure type of assessment where they can do anything from showing me how they can play to conducting a piece to writing about the piece and that's how they show me that they understand the material. Thank you very much for listening and that's how I differentiate instruction in my classroom. Okay, so you can put in the chat, what um, strategies does she mention or what um, characteristics or elements does she mention that relate to differentiated instruction? And the follow-up question is what, what didn't she mention that maybe she could have? or maybe something you're doing in your classroom that she did not mention that is related to the characteristics or elements of differentiated instruction.
Yep, lots of assessment, exit slip, process change, traditional, oh, process change, traditional seating. Yep. She mentioned grouping and ways to better assist her students listening, her access to the individuals needing assistance. Yep. Seating students differently so they can hear different parts and she can help. Yep. That was a big change. She didn't mention anything about students working together. It was all about the individual student. Right, yep, she didn't. Didn't notice anything about exploration. There was the like choose your own adventure. I think that would be maybe the only, um, and that was like a, the level four, I believe. So that was a, a deeper type of ass assessment where she was allowing students to explore. Um, choice on the type of evaluation, written or playing, yeah. She also could do some regrouping by sections and small groups to work on the piece together, yes. Yeah, it depends on the physical space. We are definitely limited by that for sure. Yep. At the beginning, at the very, very beginning, she implied something when she was talking about like, some of my students are Boy Scouts, some of them are dancers. So she, she gets to know these other aspects of her students that aren't related to the classroom, which is huge um, because that, tells you how they vary in some ways. Pink slash blue is not differentiated. I'm not sure what that's referring to. She mentioned something about like our students at our middle school have a choice of music classes and, and there were only two. There was just band and orchestra, I think. Um, and I was thinking like, oh, my school is actually pretty good at that because we have band, orchestra, music production, chorus, and, and there's like a guitar ukulele class. So there's a lot of options when you get to the middle school, um, which I think, I think is great. The music production class is really cool. Um, Monique says, using movement to demonstrate musical understanding. Mm -hmm. Anything else anyone wants to add about strategies Ms. McKay used or strategies she didn't mention before moving on? So I think we have time for this, yes. So you, you saw Ms. McKay, um, she had like this choose your own adventure option. And it's, to me, you can use it as an extension menu for students who maybe are really quickly to master, quick to master something, or I don't know, we all have students where they're like, I'm done. And they did really well with whatever task it was that you gave them. Um, so having an extension menu on hand for these students can be helpful. The only thing, um, when, I, when I first made this presentation years ago and, and still now, like if you look up extension menus for art, like music and art classes, like they don't exist. <laughs> um, they exist for like math and social studies and science and ELA, but not, not for the arts classes. So um, I've had these groups do this and my graduate classes do this every, for years. So now there's like lots of them that exist. Um, 
But having the extension menu, that's, that's an option to differentiate assessment for the students who are fast in your class. So just remember that if you have a student that's gifted or high achieving, giving them just more work, um, that, that's, that's not going to help them. They're going to get bored with that and sometimes act out. So we need to give them deeper work. And here are some examples that um, previous students that I've taught have made. So if you have a middle school band or orchestra, um, here on the, it's almost like a bingo board sort of, the outside are choices that they can pick and, and, and do on their own. Or in the middle, we're giving them the option, like, well, you, if you have something you wanna do related to this lesson, um, you, can, you can do that. So I want to leave this up long enough so you can you can take a look. And then I have one other um, extension menu that a previous student of mine had created. So I'm going to move to that slide now. This is for a guitar class, a high school guitar class. This could probably work for a middle school guitar class as well. So in the chat, um, the question I'd, I'm gonna ask is, if you had an extension menu for your class, what things might you put on it? Um, so could you write what your class, is, what class you're thinking of, and maybe one or two or three tasks that you might provide to students that are high achieving or or gifted or they accelerate in your class. And if you want me to go back to the other extension menu, just put it in the chat, and I'll go back to that slide. So uh, just to repeat. Um, in the chat, if you could share which what your class is, the name of your class, and maybe one to three extension opportunities you might put on an extension menu. Give it 10 more seconds. It's okay if you don't have anything. Oh, here we go. I'm popping in now. Um, Laura says, fifth and sixth grade general music. One thing could be giving them an unfinished but recognizable song on Chrome Music Lab Song Maker. I don't know about that, curious. And having them find which notes are missing and complete the song. I love that idea. Write an article for class newsletter or record a short piece about the top topic for podcasts. Fun. Um, uh, this is for an elementary general music class. Transcribe a melody for boom whackers with notes and colors. I love that. Great. All right, I'm going to move us on. Oh, never mind. There's another thing in the chat. So this is fourth to eighth grade band. One is perform a mini concert for your family. Love it. Two, find a popular song you want to learn and begin teaching yourself the melody. Excellent. Okay, moving us on. So I love this chart. It shows the difference between a classroom that is not differentiated, just an example of the flow of the class. And you can see like steps one, two, three, all the way to 13. And I think that this is, this is across like a unit that you're teaching. Um, it's not just one, one lesson. Um, and then in the bottom half, this is 
the same class. So it's, it's pretty vague. It's supposed to apply to any class. And the flow of the unit when it's differentiated. So what I'd like you to do is you can skim over the before, but look at the after flow of a classroom that's been differentiated. And what I want you to do in the chat is write down some words that you're seeing repeated a lot in the, the after flow or, or any themes that you're seeing come up across the instruction as, as you go through each step. So any repeated keywords that you're noticing or themes that you're noticing in the, the differentiated instruction flow in the bottom half. Um, so we have the words varied, tiered, And if there's any words you don't know, like some people might not know what a jigsaw is, it's like a learning protocol, um, or an exit card or an exit ticket, just ask in the chat and I can explain it to you. Options is a word that gets repeated. Student knowledge, skills, and interests gets brought up, that's a theme. We're just looking for any repeated keywords or themes that are, are popping up. Thanks, Rhoda. <laughs> we have the thread is that there are a lot of options and variety to choose from. They are student-centered, yes. That is the main theme. Give this one more minute. Okay, if you have some other things and you want to include them in the chat later, feel free. So here is the summary. And I've underlined the keywords here. So keyword student differences, adjusts, all students, collaborate, and flexibility in all caps. Um, so I'll just read these to you. The teacher understands, appreciates, and builds upon student differences. Assessment instruction and instruction go hand in hand. Assessment tells you what the next instruction is going to be like, and the instruction helps you decide what the assessment is going to be, and it's this, this cycle. The teacher adjusts the content process and product in response to students' readiness, interests, and learning profile. So we had um, someone in the chat who mentioned, like, with groupings, you know, I group them a certain way at the beginning of the school year, and depending on how that goes, then I make adjustments later. <clears throat> Goal. All students are participating. All students have access. All students are set up for success. Students and teachers collaborate in learning. Sometimes I'll ask my students, like I'll just ask them, was this lesson helpful? <laughs> Did you find that this helped you in another class? Or like, you know, give me feedback. What do you, tell me what you thought. And I try to create a safe learning environment so that they feel comfortable sharing that. Um, but they're kind of part they help me design instruction for them because they tell me what works and what doesn't. And 
obviously flexibility is the hallmark of differentiated classroom. I think sometimes it's it's easy to get stuck in a pattern of teaching because it, it worked in the past. And um, the thing is every, every year we have new students and kids move out and they move in and, and we need to be flexible to them as learners and as people. And also like they're always changing. You probably have, I mean, I think as an arts teacher, you, you teach across many grade levels. So you're seeing students grow and age and they, they change so much as they get older. I, I used to teach sixth, seventh and eighth. So even within those three years, the kids would change so much across the three years. So as teachers, we need to be flexible and adjust to those changes. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, when you get the, the PDF. I think that this will link to Carol Ann Tomlinson's book. Um, it's just, it's a PDF of her book. It's free, which is where I got a lot of those screen grabs. Um, so why is differentiated instruction critical? What happens if you don't differentiate in your classroom? So that is open to the chat. Why is differentiated instruction critical? And if you don't differentiate, what is the result? So you can answer that with your, your, your thoughts in the chat. Yeah, some students won't learn if you don't differentiate. It's so true. Students are going to feel left out. Yeah, if the teacher is only teaching to one type of student and you're not that type, you will be left out. You won't inspire all your students. Yeah. Yeah, they're just gonna like, all right, well, I need to get through and and get through my teacher's class. I'm not really passionate about it. Just gonna try to get a good grade, but yeah, not really having much feeling about it. Uh, we have differentiation is critical in order to reach all students. It can get the attention of students who might be left behind otherwise, and it fosters students' interest in learning. Yeah. There's that interest again and the inspiration and the passion. If you're not differentiating, behaviors might arise. We're gonna talk about behaviors in the next session. You can't expect students to work together if they're all comfortable working in different modalities. You will lose some of the students along the way. Um, Krista, I'm not sure I understand, you can't expect students to work together if they are all comfortable working in different modalities. Like, does that mean if one student is comfortable with like the visual modality and one student's comfortable with the listening modality, they can't work together? Kids feel a comfortable level, a comfort level to work in a way that works for them and intimidation goes away. Right. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a safer learning environment because their choices are being honored. So I wanna think about like kids being left, students being left behind. I'm seeing that theme a lot in the chat right now. Um, or like losing some students and being left behind if you don't differentiate. So, okay. Oh, we have something else in the chat. Uh, if you're only teaching one way and you try to group them up, those learners who aren't comfortable learning visually, et cetera, will be lost. Totally, I get it now. Thank you for um, for clarifying that, Krista. Yeah, if you're, and I'm, I do have some colleagues who are kind of new to teaching and they are teaching in one way. Um, and, and that takes time as you as you are in the profession, you 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 learn um, as a teacher. Um, but a lot of my students on IEPs 
are having struggles are having a hard time or they're struggling like connecting to the content because it's only being taught in one way with that that flow that you saw that top part of the screen like the before differentiation that is the flow of some of my colleagues classes um so it's, it's a learning process as a teacher you know um but some of my students are really struggling because of that so Inclusion. So remember the Venn diagram we had at the beginning with universal design, differentiation, um, and accommodations and modifications from IEPs, and they all intersected to meet the needs of all students. So if you know all of those principles and you're trying your best to apply them in your class, you will create the maximum inclusion environment. Yay. <laughs> Um, and that means students will be able to access your curriculum and learn with their peers and they hopefully won't get behind and they'll actually like, love coming to your class. But sadly, sometimes, like you all said in the chat, if you're not differentiating and students do get left behind, uh, we, and we just had a discussion about this in my one of the special ed meetings at my school yesterday about whether or not to pull some students out of the math general education classroom because they're really having a hard time accessing it. And the teacher that was reporting on it was like, well, you know, if everyone's differentiating, I don't know if we need to have this conversation. It's just, it's sad that some students might have to get pulled out into a substantially separate classroom. And if, I'm not, I'm not sure if everyone knows what that means, but it's like, the special education room. It's, just, it's like a different physical space from where the rest of their peers are learning. And it's, it's a re more restrictive environment um, according to the law. So if the gen ed teachers aren't doing the things in the Venn diagram that we saw at the beginning, students will struggle because you're only teaching to one type of student. Um, and the rest of the students that aren't like that might fall behind in different ways. And again, they might be pulled out for another service. Like, whew, like some of our students get pulled out of conservatory because maybe I'm, make, I'm totally making this up. Maybe the math teacher isn't differentiating. So they need extra instruction in math so that they can access that math class. So they get pulled out of conservatory, which is, I don't know, that like is really sad for me as a person who works at, at Berkeley and teaches about this stuff. Um, and you know, some students, they just aren't interested in being in the orchestra anymore. And maybe because it's really hard, you know, and it's not being differentiated. I'm not gonna make assumptions. Every situation is complex. Every student is very complicated. Um, but we do know that if you apply the practices of UDL, differentiated instruction, it's more likely that students will be included where they can be with their peers together. Okay, so our final thing, I can't believe how on time I am. I usually go much, uh, like I go over the limit. So we have till 11. And if we end a little early, that's okay. We'll have a little extra time for the, the second presentation. Um, okay, so we have a lot of participants. Kahoot, uh, you, maybe some of you are familiar with it. It's kind of like a gamified learning website platform. And you will log in onto a mobile device. The problem is that only 10 people, I guess, I don't know why it says only 10, because we do this with the whole classroom. Um, but on the website today, it said only 10 people are allowed in the session. I'm gonna try, I'm gonna, maybe I misread that. Anyway, if you have a phone, go to this website, kahoot.it. I'm gonna give you the game pin, that's the code in a couple minutes, so hang tight. Um, and what's gonna happen is a question will pop up on the Zoom. I changed the setting so it will also pop up. The question will be shown on your phone. So you might not have to look at the question on, your, on the Zoom. Um, and you just wanna make sure that whatever answer you pick, like if you wanna pick the red triangle, students vary in age. Make sure that's what you're picking on your phone. Because I think on your phone, the answers aren't, aren't there. I think they just have the color and the shape. So what happens a lot with kids is 
they want to pick, they're like, oh, students vary in age, that's the right answer. And then they pick the blue diamond and they're like, no, that's not what I meant to click. So just make sure your answer matches up with the color and the shape. Okay, I think there's nine questions. Let's stop sharing for one second. So you're going to kahoot.it. Yeah, this is this is new. Play live games with up to 10 players. It's, I, I feel like that's a that's an update. They're trying to get us to pay for Kahoot. So I'm sorry if, if people get left behind. Um yeah, so www.kahoot.it, and then you're gonna enter this pin number at the top, 365. Seven four nine five, and this is all fun, fun. And I have um, it's called the nickname generator on, so there's just an adjective and an animal, so you don't have to enter your name. I wonder if more than ten people will be allowed in. This little cap off. Oh, good. Yes, there more than ten. Okay. We have twenty six people, so not a, you don't have to play. Not required. <laughs> but I want to give it enough time so that people can get on. Thank you, Guillermo. Okay, I'm gonna give it like 30 more seconds. All right, I'm going to start. Sorry if I left some people behind. <laughs> so I will read the questions out loud too, if that helps. What does differentiated instruction recognize? Students only vary in age. Students have the same learning styles. Students vary in language, prior knowledge and abilities. Teachers only teach high achieving of students. So you have a time limit here. There's three seconds left. Great. Yes, everyone got it right. <laughs> okay. Anyone have questions about how this works? <laughs> Just want to make sure everyone knows what we're doing. All right. And so there's a scoreboard. Everyone got it right, but you get some extra points if you went faster. One that's one thing I don't like about Kahoot. I wish you could disable the feature about answering quickly because um, that kind of leaves out my students who might need some extra time to read or process information. Number two, which word best describes the content activities and assessments in a DI classroom? Repeated, lecture-based, variety, rote. All right, yep, variety, that's it. Um, and just a heads up, I can't remember if it's this Kahoot or another one I've made for a different class, but they limit the amount of characters you can have in a question and a multiple choice option. So I may have abbreviated a couple times, so I'll just explain that to you if that comes up. Which of the following is not an example of differentiated content? 
teacher ensures that all material is covered. All students are able to access content. Teacher provides opportunities for students to explore content. Students apply learned skills and strategies. We're looking for what's not differentiated. Great, teacher ensures that all material is covered. That is not differentiated. That is not the focus of differentiation. Red Koala has a streak with three correct answers in a row. Which of the following is a list of characteristics which can be di differentiated? So lecture, worksheets, practice, paper tests, instruction, assessments, groupings, exploration, one teaching style, one activity, one type of assessment. Yay, this is giving me some good feedback. <laughs> Ooh, Lively Urchin is on fire. <laughs> Number five, which of the following is not a classroom element that can be differentiated? Content, the what, trick question, all elements can be differentiated. Process, the how, product, the assessment. Yes, so all the elements can be differentiated. No matter what you're doing, it can be differentiated. Um, the product, the assessment, that's how we evaluate students. That can be differentiated and the what, what you're teaching, the content can be differentiated. <clears throat> oh, Swift 10, you're on fire now. <laughs> When and how should I assess my students' understanding of the content? Throughout the unit, assessment is ongoing and varied. At the end of the unit, students get the same assessment. I don't need to assess my students. Excellent. Yeah, you're always assessing, and there's a variety of types of assessment. Okay, now Bright Lark, making a comeback. <laughs> Question seven, what is one thing I can do if a student is struggling? Too bad, she will just get a bad grade. Adjust my content process and products to meet her needs. Let someone else like the special education teacher deal with it. Nice. So you're probably like, how is this even an assessment? It's so easy. But sometimes <laughs> assessments can be used to, to teach. Like some of these answers are really obviously wrong, right? But if you're a kid in a class and you are struggling, you might be able to use process of elimination to figure out what's correct. And that might actually like help with your memory and, and provide instruction as well. Assessments are learning opportunities for students too. All right, Charming Dragon is still in the lead. Two more questions. How is the process in which students learn differentiated? So the process. Students work in a variety of groupings and make choices. I lecture most days when students play their instruments. Students play their instruments and I listen. Students must follow my directions. If not, I send them to the office. Great. Everyone got that? Ooh, Wise Glider, very close to Charming Dragon. One more question. What happens if you only teach to one type of student? Some students will not be engaged. Some students may not be able to be successful. Some students will exhibit behaviors. Some students may need to be pulled out because it's too hard. They're all correct. No one was wrong on that one. Lots of consequences to only teaching to one type of student. Oh, and here's the podium. 
Kids love this part of the Kahoot. Some kids are really competitive. <laughs> Ooh, wise fire. Whoever you are, nice job. And everybody else, great. <laughs> All right. So then you can, I think that you have the opportunity to get feedback. Is that, oh yeah, you can give. You can give feedback on how that went to the teacher. <laughs> I love Kahoot too, <laughs> Charmaine. So it looks like we've got a, a rating of 4.0, oh, 4.7. Thumbs up on the learning outcome. Recommend, feeling, feeling good. Oh, I'm sorry, Liz, you don't have to play. You can opt out. Sorry about that. Sorry, you're not feeling well. Okay, so I think, let me stop share for a second. Okay. Um, so that is it for this. Oh, there's a couple things in the chat. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's good to know that some students might might feel this way and I'm glad that you communicated Liz about how you're feeling. Um, Alyssa says to avoid the time nature of Kahoot, you should try Blooklet, blooklet.com. It is similar, but lots of the games are not time-based. I love that. I'm definitely gonna check it out. Um, I love Kahoot, made me smile and laugh. It's distracting to my brain, especially with, which is not. Yeah, I actually, I never use the not questions with kids at all. Um, Cause it is, you have to kind of like reverse what you're thinking. Didn't know about the nickname generator. That would be a game changer for middle school students. Yep, it really is. <laughs> um, so that is the end of this presentation. Um, so Rhoda, if you're here, should we open it up for Q and A or should we take our five minute break and move on to the, um, next presentation after I that. am absolutely here. So it is 1056. I think we should do a little bit of Q&A and then do our five minute stretch break and come back. I would say maybe five to seven minutes of Q&A. Okay. So if folks have questions, comments, things they want to talk about with Vicki, please put them in the chat. Thanks. And I'm going to set a five minute timer so I don't lose track of time. Um, Suzanne says, when you only see students once a week, differentiation can be a struggle. Any advice about long range planning? So I guess I would ask first, um, what part of it is a struggle? Is it the getting to know the students because you don't see them much? Is it you, you, you know, you're doing the ongoing assessment, but you don't know how that's going to inform the following week? Um, I don't want to make an assumption. So that's for Suzanne, um, just to clarify. Uh, we have 
a question in the Q&A from Liz. I often consult with classroom teachers early on to get their input on differentiating their class and build on that. Yes. Oh my gosh, please collaborate with as many people as possible. And that actually might help with Suzanne's question um, because you can talk to the other classroom teachers who see students more often. And if they're differentiating in a certain way, you can kind of be inspired. Uh, Liz says, I don't mean that I copy what they're doing because students like to change things up. But I mean, consistency is really important. So that might help Suzanne, um, see what other teachers in your school are doing. Um, Chris says, how long do you think is reasonable to keep pupils struggling in DI class? I ask as I think some of our SFL pupils are withdrawn too early in their learning process. I don't think too long. I don't think there's such a thing as too long. I think keep them in as much as possible. Um, Cause like I said, students change over time and you just, I mean, they change within a day sometimes but you just never know what moment is gonna click for them. And maybe like a month from now, they might make a ton of progress. Um, so I would say in your mind, like assume students are always going to be included in your classroom because that is going to benefit them the most and it will benefit their peers too. Um, Krista says, differentiation with younger students K to two is a little more challenging because we don't do long-term projects. Any tips for working with the little ones? Yeah, you can't, like kids that age don't have executive functioning skills that would allow them to think ahead. Like I think, oh, I don't wanna misspeak, but I think that age, they can really only think ahead like three hours, <laughs> um, if that. So you'd, you definitely don't wanna assess them on long-term projects at all. Um, but if you're only seeing them once or twice a week, um, yeah, I guess I don't work with that age group, but I, I'm wondering, Krista, can you remind me, are you a music teacher or an arts teacher? Krista is a music teacher. Thank you, Rhoda. Um, yeah, so you might have to have like short, you know, single class assessments. I would say when we're working with young, younger students and Krista will talk about this in this afternoon session, um, it's not even just single class assessments. There are like multiple activities in the single class. You could go activity by activity in terms of thinking around differentiation. Yeah, and an assessment is, I guess your, is your question asking about assessment? Because you mentioned long-term projects. And if so, we talked about assessment extensively, extens extensively last time. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, a little okay. more challenging, I'm looking at Krista. Oh, that's how she does it. She was just yeah. curious, got it. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't think you should do long-term projects at that age um, because of the executive functioning um, developments at that, at that time. <laughs> Um, and then Chris says, obviously that's down to individuals, but do you have a threshold for which you look to establish progress? Yeah, I, I think, okay, and this is the last question because my timer went off. Um, so as a special education teacher, the way I assess progress is completely individualized. Um, it is not fully based on the standards. You probably as a gen ed teacher have to use the standards to assess students, but you, they don't, like, like we've been talking about, you can be flexible with that. Um, it doesn't, they don't have to fit into this, this box uh, perfectly. So progress for one student might look different than progress for another. And if you are taking data, you'll, you can see if a student makes progress within whatever objectives you have for them. Um, Um, Chris, SFL, is that speech? I'm not sure what SFL is. I haven't seen that acronym before. Support, oh, support for learning. Okay. So that's just probably special education in the US, I'm guessing. Um, yeah, I mean, I think every school is a little bit different, which is too bad. Um, but ultimately for kids with special needs, you have to assess progress 
in a differentiated way. Um, and that's what we're talking about today. They, progress for that, like if you were to chart it on a line graph, is a student making steady progress? That's, that's what matters. And maybe other students are making more accelerated progress and that's okay because they're all at different places with the content. Um, okay, so I have to stop. Um, thank you so much for participating and being a part of this. So I think we're gonna take a five to seven minute break. Rhoda, do we keep the Zoom going? Is that, how does that work? Absolutely, nobody leave the Zoom room. We all stay here. We're gonna, and I don't want seven, it's five. We're gonna do a five minute stretch and then come back for your next topic. So at 11.10? Yes. 11.10 Eastern time, everyone come back, 11.10. I Feel will. free to um, step away from the computer, but we'll we'll start right up again promptly at, at eleven ten. And I'm going to shut off my camera and mic as well. Thank you, everybody.
All right, so it's 11.10, so we're going to resume with the second presentation about behavior management. Um, so welcome back from your very short break. Okay, so for this presentation, um, I just wanna put it out there that the things that I'm gonna teach you about are things I want you to keep in the back of your mind. Uh, so there's, there's stuff up in the third section we're gonna talk about taking data. I totally get that that might be impossible, but it's good to know about these procedures just because that might inform how you decide how, what to do next with students with challenging behavior. So we'll talk more specifically about that when we get to it, but I'm just putting it out there that I recognize you, don't, you might not see students as often as other teachers and taking data might be impossible. So we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get there. Um, so we're gonna do an overview about behavior. We're gonna talk about the functions of behavior. We're gonna talk about this data um, that you could take if you wanted. Um, and then plans, interventions, and tools that you could use. And then we might have time at the end for the difference between emotional reactions and um, challenging behavior, because you should know that there's a difference between those. All right, so how can we manage challenging behavior? So first, you want to be proactive. You want to get ahead of challenging behavior. So a few things you can do, which we talked about in the last uh, presentation, learn about your students before the new school year begins. If you, if you don't, if they're new to you, um, learn everything about them. And if the student has challenging behavior, you might want to learn more about them than the other students. So you really understand um, some of the root, the root causes of some of the behaviors. And of course, relationships number two, relationships go such a long way with the most vulnerable students. You want your students to trust you. You want to be the safe adult. Um, there's so many kids that can't connect with teachers in school and maybe you're the one that they really connect with. Um, so really just think about being the safe, trusted adult. And this one is huge. All behavior, all, cha all challenging behavior is a form of communication. So if you have a student with challenging behavior, you might wanna ask yourself, what is it that they're trying to communicate that they are having trouble saying to me? Like if they, if they, could com if they had the skill of communicating something, what are they trying to tell me through this behavior? because it is a form of communication. And it could also be an underdeveloped skill that they, they just haven't learned um, some sort of life skill along the way and they're acting out in this way. So they might need some sort of direct instruction on that underdeveloped skill to be able to um, regulate the behavior that they're exhibiting. So those are kind of preemptive, proactive strategies that you wanna use before any challenging behavior happens. So reactive stress, oh, so I should have explained what these pictures mean. So be proactive, there's a kid in the rain with an umbrella. He thought ahead, he was proactive, he knew it might rain. He got, this is an analogy, he got the umbrella, he was prepared. He made a, a proactive decision. And then this kid, he didn't think ahead, he wasn't, um, proactive. Instead, he went outside without an umbrella. He gets all wet. That's the consequence. That's what happens after he made the choice to not bring an umbrella. So that it's just a silly analogy. Um, so as a teacher, reactive strategies in the world of behavior management, we call them consequences. So that just means what happens um, after a behavior. But these are some strategies you can do after you observe a behavior. Um, consult with the stakeholders. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. Take data if you can. I'm gonna show you a very, um, the very specific way to take data. You might wanna kind of modify that in a way that's really simple for you. Um, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about how you determine what the function of the behavior is. 
And then based on that, then you can decide a consequence that might be giving an accommodation or an intervention. <clears throat> also, try to maintain positivity. I had a student in my class yesterday, <coughs> excuse me, who had some challenging behavior and I just had to not get sucked into his negativity and his anger and frustration and just, you know, try to be neutral or positive is fine, but you don't wanna like meet their intensity or severity and, and mirror them. You wanna try to be cool, calm and collected. Um, See in the chat, sorry. <clears throat> um, I can't see or hear you and I think they have to sign out and sign back in because um, I left my Zoom on and you're, you're doing, you're perfect. So okay. I think it's a technical thing on that end. We haven't heard from other people about that problem. So. Okay, okay. Um, and then you wanna be consistent. So whatever it is that you do, you wanna be predictable. Like the students should expect the same reaction from you, whatever that is, because um, that makes kids feel safe and, and they trust you if you're consistent and predictable. <laughs> um, and then be patient because sometimes some of these interventions that we're going to talk about can take a while. <clears throat> okay, so on the previous slide, we talked about consulting with the stakeholders. So you have a student in your class who has some sort of challenging behavior. You should not go it alone. You should not Try to handle it on your own because there are other people in the school that might have some information that can enlighten you or inspire you or help inform your, your practice. So don't go it alone. Collaborate, consult with the people. So the first question you want to ask is, well, is this student on an IEP? And <clears throat> For those that aren't in the United States, um, you might have something similar, just an individualized education plan um, for students with special needs. So if the student is on the IEP, this is a flowchart. Yes, they are on the IEP. You will want to talk to the special education teacher or the liaison. That's, that's me um, in my school. I am the liaison or the special education teacher. I am the bridge between all of the people on this slide. Paraprofessional, if the student has one, paraprofessional might be with them, with, with the student throughout a lot of the day. So the paraprofessional might have some really interesting insight because they see how students are across different settings. <clears throat> and if your school has a BCBA, that stands for Board Certified Behavior Analyst, um, they might be called a behaviorist, but that person's job is to support the student and the teachers with challenging behavior. That person is going to have a lot of insight. And then you're going to want to maybe talk to the parents if this is something that has happened multiple times or it's like a repeated thing and you need their support. Guidance counselor or school psychologist might know a lot about the student because maybe they're, they have um, sessions with this student. And I have a dotted line going to administration because we don't want to involve like the principal or the vice principal right away um, if it's something minor. If it's a very severe behavior, like if there's physical aggression um, or like some hate speech or something with discrimination, like yes, you should let the principal and vice principal know for sure. Um, but for like, I don't know, standard challenging behavior, you kind of want to wait to communicate with your administration, unless your principal and vice principal have told you they want to hear about every single behavior. Um, you don't need to involve them until it's happened a lot or it's very severe. <clears throat> and then if the student is not on an IEP, so in purple, um, these are the people you might want to consult with. And the difference here is there's classroom teachers down on the bottom. Um, so maybe that is the person you'd want to talk to. Um, and yeah, student does not need to have special needs or be on an IEP to exhibit challenging behavior. Okay, so big ideas are underlined. So 
if you're going to internalize one thing from this presentation, it's this whole slide. Because these are the thoughts that run through the minds of teachers who work with students with challenging behavior a lot. So behavior is a form of communication. It might be a sign of an underdeveloped skill. Like maybe the student doesn't know that they should ask to borrow something and they just take something from another kid. Like they don't have the skill of asking. And behavior has a function, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if you're in a situation, students acting out, ask yourself, what are they trying to tell me? And then once you figure that out and you figure out the function, then you can decide what to do next. So yeah, I just wanna put this out there. Like whenever I teach about this in person, a lot of people will like raise their hand and they'll be like, I have a student who has this behavior and they'll explain what they've observed and they wanna know what should I do? And so then my response is usually like tons of questions to really get at, well, what, do you, what does the teacher think the kid is trying to say? And what does the teacher think the function of the behavior is? Because you can't just come up with a plan for behavior without really thinking about these other things that we're gonna talk about. So I will always say that, you know, like if, and if we have time for the Q and A, I'll say, well, you know, what do you think they're trying to tell you? What do you think the function is? And that will really help you figure out what to do next. Okay, so normally when we're in person, I'll, I'll ask the group, like what behaviors, what challenging behaviors have you observed? And I'll like make, I'll type and I'll take notes and make this list. So this is the list from last year, or the, I think the year before, um, of what the group that you're in right now came up with. These are some, challenging behaviors educators have observed in their classroom. Now, what gets tricky sometimes, sometimes a teacher might um, share something that's not a behavior, it might, maybe it's more of a feeling. So then I have to kind of guide them like, no, like the behavior is something you can observe, like something that you see, what the student is doing. So all of these, I think we had more than 15, but this is all that fit on the slide. These are things that you can, observe, you can see, um, and they, they don't have any feelings attached to them. So take a look at the list. And maybe you identify with some of these because you have or have had students exhibit these behaviors. The thing about like the Zoom teaching that some people may have done, um, behaviors, if, if you're doing a fully remote class, challenging behavior and classroom management was didn't look like this, right? Like maybe it, it, like it was more behavior, um, like the student was just not focused or um, wasn't participating, but there wasn't behavior that affected other kids as much, um, at least with, with the middle school um, for me. Okay, so I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Okay, this is huge, <laughs> this part. So there's five functions of behavior. The top two, which are escape from demand and attention, I would say are the most common functions that I see when students exhibit challenging behavior. Um, so the first one, escape from demand, all that means is the student doesn't want to follow the directions or complete the task. They're not interested. Um, and whatever it is that they want to do is way more rewarding um, than what you want them to do. So the behavior you might see that relates back to that function is a student may tantrum because he does not want to complete his homework. And we'll talk a little bit about how behavior can kind of reinforce itself in a loop but maybe the student's tantruming works and gets him out of doing his homework because the adults in his life respond to it. And so he's learned along the way that if I tantrum, I don't have to do my homework. I can escape from the demand. And that is a sign of, well, they're communicating that he's communicating, he doesn't want to do his homework and he has an underdeveloped skill. Well, maybe the homework's too hard and he doesn't know how to communicate about that. 
Um, and then attention seeking is the second most popular uh, function. And sometimes that combines with escape from demand and that really makes things tricky. But the student wants to gain attention. It could be positive or negative from others. So a student may throw his instrument because the consequence may entail negative attention from teachers and peers. The tricky thing about this kind of attention seeking where when students want to seek attention from the whole class, as teachers, we don't have as much control over how classmates respond. We do have control over how we respond, um, but that can be a really messy situation when students are seeking attention from the whole class. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, you know, if a student is attention seeking and they're trying to gain negative attention, um, because it's, sometimes it's easier to get negative attention than positive attention, and that's why students do that. That tells me that I need to be giving them more attention. That's what they're asking for. That's what, that, what, that's what they're communicating. And they don't have the skill of getting positive attention yet. That's an underdeveloped skill. So as a teacher, I want to try to find as many opportunities as possible to praise them for doing what they're supposed to be doing, praising the desired behavior. Um, and just trying to connect with them and in, in a way that I might not normally connect with other students because they're needing that attention for whatever reason. Um, the third function is access to tangible. So that just means the, students, the student wants to gain access to an object or a food. So you might see a student get out of their seat because they wanna play with the instrument across the room. <laughs> um, so, I mean, they don't have the ability to ask like, oh, can I play with that? Or, um, you know, so this, this is, they're communicating. They, they really like that instrument. They, maybe they like the sound of it, which would be sensory. Um, and they don't know how to ask. That's the underdeveloped skill. And maybe this strategy, this behavior has worked their whole lives. You know, get out of your seat to get the thing that you want and no adult has taught you that you need to ask before you get out of seat. Sensory, the student may be experiencing sensory overload or stimulation. So that might be common in some students with autism. They might be hypersensitive or hyposensitive and in the music classroom and the art classroom, um, I don't know if anyone's familiar with tactile defensiveness. It's when like things feel very uncomfortable on the hands. So whatever, plays or textures you're working with might feel painful for some students. Um, a student may scream when other musicians are warming up their instruments loudly. I mean, sometimes I'm screaming in my head when that's happening because the sound is so intense and unpleasant. But for pe some people with autism, that might be painful for them. So their behavior is screaming um, because they don't know how to tell you or they can't tell you you know, this is really painful for me to listen to this. And an accommodation you might give them is noise canceling headphones, or maybe they don't have to be in the room when that's happening. And then physiological, that just means the student is experiencing a physical change internally. So something we really can't control. Um, if a student has a headache and they're self injurious, they might hit their head because that makes it feel better. Um, and the behavior is hitting, hitting their head and they're communicating that they're in pain. Okay, I'm gonna pause there. And I just wanna make sure that um, people are clear on the, the functions and everything I've talked about so far. So if you have any questions, I'm gonna ask you to put it in the chat now. I'm gonna give one minute for that. Or in the Q&A, that works too. Someone put something in the Q&A. And I can't get to it. One second. I have it, Vicki. I, I see it now, yeah. Good. Are these behaviors also applicable to students with, yes, without disabilities? Yep. Yeah, so um, you don't have to be on an IEP. I mean, there are students with disabilities who aren't on IEPs, um, but maybe there's something else going on um, that is affecting the behavior. And then I see, oh, thank you for the feedback, Suzanne. Makes sense. Okay. 
I'm losing my voice from all the talking. <laughs> all right. One more thing in the chat. Yeah, the attention. Krista sees it most often with attention. So you're you're thinking about it now, like, oh, my my students with challenging behavior. What's the function? You know. So you might be able to just figure it out because you've seen it happen so many times. Yeah, the student I had yesterday, it was all attention seeking. Um, so the reaction that I'm going to, the consequence, and consequence doesn't mean punishment or anything like that. It just means what's happening next. Um, I'm actually going to kind of adjust my schedule so I can see the student individually. <laughs> instead of in a small group in the learning center. And he can be as rude and disrespectful to me as pop as he wants. And I will ignore it because there aren't other children around. <laughs> um, yeah, he was really rude and disrespectful in a class and I had to address it because I didn't want my other students to see me ignoring that behavior because then that would send a message if I ignored it. But if we're in a private individual setting, I'm just gonna ignore it. And I know he wants to get a rise out of me. That's, that's the function. He wants that attention. So I'm not going to give it to him. Um, and I'm hopeful that after a few sessions like that, he'll just give up on being rude and disrespectful. But I could be wrong. I need to be flexible with my differentiation. OK, so earlier in the agenda, we talked about ABC data. So. Again, um, just to be more clear about this. So if you were a behaviorist or if you were a special ed teacher or if you were a classroom teacher that sees the student a lot, you could take very consistent data on the behavior. And generally in the world of behavior management, we want like two weeks of data or 10 data points, 10 instances. So if you were to do that, that would take months <laughs> like that's not helpful to you at all um so yes um someone wrote um uh, i think this is in response to um you do have to be on an iep or do you have to have special needs to exhibit inappropriate behavior and they wrote well maybe there's a change in the family there's trouble at home they don't feel well yeah so many reasons thank you for sharing that so I'm gonna show you how you would take data and you kind of decide how you want to use this information to inform what you do next, okay? And there's, there's like apps and stuff that you can use for this kind of data that might make it really quick. But I just, if you're only seeing students once or twice a week, you're not gonna have enough data points. So you wanna take what's called baseline data to determine the, so the goal of the data is to figure out which of the five functions or combination, ugh, combination of functions the student, um, the behavior has. And the data will tell you that. So you take data on the antecedent and that's what happened right before the behavior. The antecedent leads to the behavior. That's the challenging behavior, it's observable, it's measurable. Um, so you would, take data on how long the behavior went on for, if it's that kind of a behavior where it can be timed, or the frequency, like you tally how many times you observe it in that moment. And then you take data on the consequence, which the consequence just means what happened right after the behavior. How did you react? How did the classroom react? So that might give you some information about whether if it's attention seeking or not. So sometimes there's a situation where an antecedent leads to a behavior, which leads to a consequence, but then this consequence actually is the antecedent again, which leads to more behavior. And then you have this like cycle. Um, so that might be a situation where you're as, as a teacher inadvertently reinforcing the challenging behavior, like, maybe the student is just trying to escape from a task and they're, I don't know, like being disruptive in some way. That's very vague, but, um, and you are like, fine, you don't have to do the thing that you don't want to do. That's the consequence. 
And then that reinforces the behavior. So now the student is learning that, okay, if I just act this way, then I can get out of doing what I want it, I don't want to do. And then you have this cycle. And it's it's hard to see sometimes that we as teachers might be doing that in the moment. And the data can help you with that, help you be more aware of that. Um, another piece just to keep in mind, and this isn't like a black and white statement, but sometimes behavior has an element of choice to it. Like students do have control over behavior. Um, and, and it's like a learned, sometimes it's a learned thing. Sometimes they just don't know how to communicate and they don't have, they have an underdeveloped skill. They haven't learned the skill. Um, so there is some component of choice. Like they're choosing to act a certain way, even if it's unconscious. And we'll talk, if we have time later, I just want to point out like an emotional reaction that's based in anxiety. Most people cannot control that. And the stuff that we're talking about right now does not apply to that kind of um, behavior you might observe. So if the student has severe anxiety or any type of anxiety, and that is what's driving their behavior, you're going to need more of a therapeutic approach for that. And that is not within our realms as, as teachers. That would be like the guidance counselor, school psychologist would help them with that. Um, yeah, uh, and, and I really hope we have time for the very last slide, which shows the difference between anxiety-based emotional reactions and challenging behavior that is based, like it's learned over time, it's a, it has a function, students trying to communicate something and they don't know how. Like they're very different, but sometimes there's a little overlap, so it can get, it can get tricky. Okay, so this is what an ABC data sheet might look like if you had it printed out on a piece of paper. So you wanna take data on the date and the time that it is, maybe the setting events. So if you're an orchestra teacher, you'd put orchestra class. Right now it is May 1st, 2021. I was close at the time here, 1130. Our setting event, this should say Zoom Berkeley study group. Um, the antecedent presenter, that's me, is explaining about data and behavior. And your behavior is yawning excessively. <laughs> and the consequence is, the, I'm trying to be funny to increase your engagement. Ha ha ha. Okay, so let's say I took 10 data points or two weeks of data on all of you. What would your hypothesis on the function of this behavior be? So why are there participants yawning so much in my class? Is it attention seeking? Is it escape from demand? Is it access to tangible? Is it sensory based or is it physiological? So you have to kind of look at the antecedent and the consequence to decide. And we don't have enough data points at all to figure this out, but this is just a funny dot experiment. And if you want to put that in the chat, you can. So what do you think the function of this yawning excessively might be? And it could be real yawning or fake yawning. Oh, allergies. So Liz, what function would that fall under? Attention, escape from demand, access to tangible, sensory, or physiological. I can go back to the, um, the function table. Oops. Where was it? Physiological, physio. <laughs> yeah, so if you have tons of allergies and um, that's what's making you yawn, maybe you, as, as we take data, we'll see there's no connection between consequence or antecedent or setting events. Maybe, maybe it's like this time of day and that's when your allergies flare up. Physiological for maybe didn't get enough sleep last night. 
What if you have students that are purposefully yawning when you're teaching? What, like, if you can tell that they're like, oh, you know, faking it, attention seeking. Yeah, totally. Send them to drama class. <laughs> yeah, you have to have a good attitude about it. You have to laugh. Oh, like, sometimes I can get so worked up with some behaviors. Yeah, Bonnie, getting a rise out of teacher, which is attention, attention seeking. And you just gotta like kind of turn into a robot sometimes, especially with attention seeking behavior. Okay, so this is a quote from Alice Hamill's book, Teaching Music to Students with Special Needs. Um, and I will read it out loud to you. A music educator who finds ways to positively reinforce, we're gonna talk about that in a second, good behavior compliance and academic success will be far more successful than a music educator who believes all students should follow the same set number of rules to the same degree every day of the school year. Remember, fair is not equal. So the second part of this quote is a teacher who does not differentiate, <laughs> bringing it back to, calling it back to the first presentation. Um, all students follow the same set rules, same degree, every day. Very rigid kind of teaching. Um, so positive reinforcement is something we're going to talk about. I believe it's on the next slide. Oh, no, fair is not equal is what we're going to talk about. That's on the next slide. And then positive reinforcement is after that. I apologize. So we heard about fair is not equal with differentiation. Um, so we want to do what's fair. Right? We want to do what's fair for all students, but we can't do what's fair if we're giving them the same equal thing. Like every student needs something different. And in that video we watched with the animation at the beginning of the differentiated instruction presentation, um, the teacher at the end talked about how the culture of his classroom directly teaches that every single student needs something different. And that's like a huge teaching philosophy for me. Um, every student needs something different. And that's what's gonna help students achieve the best that they can. And it, that applies to behavior management. So you may have already, I'm, I feel like a lot of the instructors in the study group use very similar visuals because we've been doing it for so long. But um, forgive me if you've seen this already. Why do you think this, this is like an outdated um, visual that you used to demonstrate fair is not equal. Um, and you can see these people are watching a baseball game. You have three people with different heights. And on the left, the shortest person is, they're all given the same box. They're all given the same support. The shortest person cannot see the baseball game. And on the right, they're saying, oh, look, this shows fair is not equal because the each person's getting something different. Zero boxes, one box, two boxes, and now they have equal access to the baseball game. So that was kind of a visual that a lot of people used to use to show fair is not equal, but now it's a bit outdated. Do you guys know why? Remove the fence. Oh, interesting. So the, the thing that's getting in the way instead of giving the support, change the fence. UDL, remove the barrier for all people. Love it. All humans with shorts look the same. Chain link? Oh, a chain link fence, a chain link fence. <laughs> okay, yes, so they can see through it. Um, Okay, so those are all great responses, love it. And then, have you guys seen this image before? That this is a little bit more of an appropriate... Right, okay, so Liz, you, you, you got it. Like, all these people look the same. That's kind of the difference here, in quality and equity. So this is, the first one's kind of assuming that that they're like at a disadvantage because they're short. But here they're saying like, well, actually no, the people themselves are 
at all the same. They're just given different, they, they're like growing up in different ways. And that's the reason why they can't see. That's the reason why the, there's a barrier. And another image is this one. So you've got the, they're starting at the same spot on the, the track, which is equal, but equity is kind of staggered out like this. So they're all starting at the same place. And this applies to differentiated instruction and the supports we give for behavior management. Okay, I'm not gonna go too in depth on this one, but in the world of behavior, there's, so again, consequences are what happens right after the behavior. That's all it means in, in this world. And we're just gonna talk about this quadrant, this upper left quadrant right here, because these other three quadrants aren't going to give you the results you want with um, increasing a desired behavior. So positive reinforcement, which Alice Hamill wrote about in her quote on a couple of slides ago, means, positive means that you're adding a stimulus. You're giving something pleasant to the student, something that they want. And reinforcement just means you're increasing or maintaining a desired behavior. So, I'm looking at the chat. Okay, one second, I just need to do an administrative thing. In a minute. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna do that later. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so, um, sorry guys. So, okay, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Zoom, Zoom difficulties. Perfect. Thank you. All set, Rhoda. <laughs> All right. So positive reinforcement. Thank you for your patience, everybody, while I was managing that. You're giving something pleasant to the student to increase or maintain the behavior that is already happening that you want. Um, so yeah, there are times where negative punishment, like negative punishment means you're removing something the kid likes to decrease the challenging behavior. Like that, there's examples here on the slide in life about what positive reinforcement and negative punishment are. But like negative punishment doesn't really work that well and it's not efficient and it creates, it like damages relationships between teachers and students. Positive reinforcement goes faster and it improves the relationship. So you're gonna get more results with managing challenging behavior if you try to think about consequences that involve positive reinforcement. So in this real life example, um, the behavior that was we want with the student is that they study for a test. The consequence, which was the result of the behavior, is that they did well, they got an A plus. So moving forward, that's going to increase the behavior or maintain the behavior of studying for the test in the future. They're more likely to study. But if they like didn't do well, you know, or they didn't study and didn't do well, that would be more negative punishment. If they didn't study, they didn't do well, they probably will still not study <laughs> in the future. It's not like a direct connection. So again, when you're thinking about plans or consequences, try to think about them as living in the world of positive reinforcement. So with that student that was really rude to me yesterday. Um, so I don't, when I meet with him individually, which is an accommodation I'm giving him, um, I'm going to try to find moments when he is on task and being polite. And I'm just gonna shower him with, you know, attention or give him, you know, I, I don't think he'd want like super, positive attention. I think he'd like like neutral, direct feedback. I think he'd like that. Um, so I'm going to try that out and see if that increases his likelihood of being on task and using polite 
respectfully. <laughs> I could be totally wrong though. All right, so in an ideal world, if you were able to take the two weeks or 10 data points of data collection, what would happen is you'd notice some sort of pattern. You'd notice that maybe there's a pattern in the antecedents or there's a pattern in the consequences. And once you've done that, you can figure out from the five functions, which were attention, escape from demand, access to tangible, sensory, or physiological, that function is gonna tell you what you should do next. So I didn't take data on the student that was being disrespectful. He's very often disrespectful to me for a number of reasons. He, he is trying to escape from demand because he, it's very complicated as all our students are. He does not want support from special ed at all. Um, he does not want help. So he does, he's trying to be rude to get out of it, which um, he's not gonna get out of it because that will reinforce that behavior. Um, there's also attention seeking because he's trying to get a rise out of me by being rude in front of other kids. So I'm hopeful that because I've noticed the, the like antecedent, which is being in the learning center, special, special ed teacher like has a problem with that, that if I try to kind of adjust the, what the um, accommodations are a little bit and I adjust the consequence, which will be ignoring the negative attention seeking, that that might address the behavior. And one thing I could do for positive reinforcement is if he is on task, which is the behavior I want. And if he's respectful, another behavior that's desired, maybe he can like, I can let him leave learning center early, which is something pleasant for him because he doesn't want to be in the learning center. So it's kind of rewarding the good behavior. I don't know. I don't know if he'll be able, I don't know if that will work. Um, so that's kind of a plan that I'm, I'm thinking of moving forward. All right. Any questions before we start talking about reactive plans? Because I have like, there's so many things you can select from um, that are just so many, so many rich resources out there. I just want to make sure there, there are clarifying questions. How do you address the rude behavior when there are other students present? I feel like this is when students deliberately escalate. Yes, and that's, what, that's kind of what happened yesterday. Um, so I just try to be neutral and firm and redirect. So in this very specific example, the student did not want to do the tasks that I gave him to do. And he kept saying, I'm done, I'm done. And I was like, you're not done. You need to keep working. And he muttered, um, Jesus Christ, like that. And, you know, I don't know what people's religions are in the room. And it doesn't matter. We never know what people's religions are and what could be offensive. So I just said, I, I had to address it because I didn't want the other students to think that that was okay. So I said, oh, you can't say that. You know, what is it, what is it that you want to say? Like, what's bothering you? Uh, and he just yelled, he yelled it at the top of his lungs and was like, it's just a person's name, Miss Lariccia. Like, what's the problem? It's just a person's name. And I was like, yeah, it is a person's name, but um, you're saying it in an angry tone. So that could be offensive to other people in the room and you're not gonna say it again. It's not appropriate. And he just kind of shut down after that, um, which I would prefer that behavior over him screaming things out loud. And I had a really hard time getting him to be on task. But again, I'd rather one behavior over the other. I'd rather him disengage than be disrespectful and rude. Um, so yeah, and I know he, he sees the school psychologist. So I told her about it, I collaborated and she checked in with him after about that and told him that he'll be meeting with me one-to-one -one moving forward. Um, so I don't know, that's the thing. Like there's no cut and dry answer. We have to kind of guess and check and see, see what works. Um, I've been cursed out before, me too. So it's a little different, but I get where you're coming from. I absolutely collaborate again. Yeah, it's like when there's other, so I, I've been in a situation where a student 
has sw sworn at me and said really hateful things, but it was just the two of us. And all I said was like, all right, if that's how you feel about me, I'm, that's, that's how you feel. Like, I don't know what to say to you. Um, and that was really impact. Like that was, that felt really good for me as the teacher because afterwards he realized that he actually didn't feel that way about me. He was just really upset about the situation and took it out on me, which I think is usually the case. I think when kids say rude things or swear at teachers, they're not really, it's not you that they're angry about. Um, and then after that, he like was super respectful of me because I didn't, and he didn't get the rise that he wanted. And he, he did talk to me about it. He was like, why didn't you get upset? I was trying to upset you. <laughs> and I was like, why are you trying to upset me? I'm your teacher. I care about you. Like, think about that. So having like a heart to heart and a conversation about it helped too. Um, but when there's other kids around, like you have to address it. So if you just name what it is, say it's not appropriate and redirect. You know, so the other kids are seeing that you're calling attention to it. Any any other questions? Oh, I see the Q and A. For some reason, I can't like click on the Q and A. I have to one second. I think when I'm sharing my screen, it goes away. Okay. Um. So I'm reading Liz's question. There are individual students with a class and also whole classrooms that universally give all specials teachers problems. I know, are there concerted efforts that all teachers who push in would use uniformly as a group? I'm not sure that I fully understand this question. I'm just rereading it, I apologize. Okay. When you say all teachers who push in, are you talking about like paraprofessionals that come to the class and special educators that come to your class? I think of concerted efforts as consistency, like everyone's doing the same thing. In other words, all the specialist teachers she's talking about, I think. The, pu the push in piece is kind of throwing me off because when I think about push in, I think about. Um, well, in your school, specials are push in. They're not, it's, it's, I guess it's different. But she's asking about um, if there are um, certain students that have challenges, that have challenging behaviors for multiple teachers, how can teachers as a group um, collaborate on strategies? Am I getting this, Liz? I think that's what she's asking. If that's what she's asking, con like consistency is key. So if all these teachers can work together on a plan, whether, it, okay, thank you. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Rhoda. <laughs> if all of these teachers can work together on a plan, like what are we going to do moving forward in all of the classes that we share with the student or with this cohort of students? Um, that is going to be the most effective. What doesn't work is when like one teacher does one thing and another teacher does another thing and you see completely different behaviors. Um, and and ugh, drives me nuts. Like one teacher might have expectations that are different from another teacher. And the one with the looser expectations kind of sets up the other teacher who has the stricter expectations for more challenging behavior because, well, so-and-so lets us do this. Why don't you let us do this? And then they act out more. And it happens so much in the middle school. Um, but ideally all teachers have the same like set of expectations, but then individually, if a student struggles with that uh, expectation, remember fair is not equal, right? So maybe that one student is working on something different, but across all the classes.
Yeah. Oh my God, Liz, totally. One teacher was giving food treats prizes and those of us who do not give rewards are unduly challenged. Totally. Um, yeah, that drives me bonkers, you know? Um, and, and that's kind of why one of my, the student that I'm referring to from yesterday was acting out because he was missing something fun in his class. And I've talked to this teacher about this before, like, you know, during this period when kids get pulled out for learning center, don't do something fun with the rest of the class because then they're not going to want to engage with me. So I'm the bad guy. Um, and it just, it drives me bonkers. But yes, if, if you have a teacher that's giving like extra rewards or prizes or has like lower expectations for the entire cohort, that sets up the other teachers for a challenge. And like they, they, we all need to be doing the same thing within the cohort. And again, if like one individual student requires certain incentives, then that would have to carry across all classes. Hmm. Yeah, it's really, it's really tricky. It's, and that's the thing, like we don't live in a vacuum, so nothing is perfect. And it, you know, it's hard when other teachers kind of set up other teachers. Um, okay, thank you, Liz. Yeah, it's tricky when you, yeah, and you can't collaborate if you have different preps. Ugh, so hard. Okay, so I'm going to continue with sharing my screen. All right, so next, there's a few different, once you've determined the function of the behavior, you're like, all right, this kid is attention seeking, or this kid's trying to escape from demand. There's a bunch of different consequences you can instill. So there's this thing called a FAIR plan. And I think if Rhoda shares this slide as a PDF, you should be able to link to this document. I'm just gonna- all, all of the slides will be shared as PDFs on Monday. Great. Um, so one second, I'm going to just preview that with you so you can, I, it's like super long. Um, we're not gonna go through the whole thing because we have like 10 minutes left. Um, so basically FAIR is an acronym, going back to the slides, F, stands for the functional hypothesis and antecedent analysis. So F just stands for taken data. What do I think the function is? What is the function of this challenging behavior? A, you just select from a list of accommodations that you can provide to support the student. I stands for interaction strategies. How do you as a teacher communicate and work with the student? And R is response strategies. So that's the consequence, what happens right after the behavior. So this is a very rich document that has tons of ideas. I love it. Um, so I'm gonna scroll through quickly because it's very long. Um, so this is the F section. There's options to select antecedents. There's options to select consequences. I'm sorry, I'm going through quickly. Here's where you select the function. Then is the A section. What are some accommodations you can give? So it's broken down into specific categories. Environmental accommodations, executive functioning accommodations, curriculum, writing, teaching underdeveloped skills, self-regulation and self-monitoring, replacement behaviors. And this would be for attention motivated behaviors self-calming instruction and practice, breaks, that would be for escape from demand. And then next is the I part of the FAIR plan, interaction strategies. So it gives you so many ideas. So general interaction here, work on explicit relationship building, use validation, um, transitions, how do, you, how do you give demands for students that don't like to be told what to do? <laughs> how many of us have those? Use humor when appropriate. I do that all the time. Make it a game. Avoid power struggles. To reduce negative att attention seeking from a teacher. So there's a list you can select from there. And then last is response strategies, which are you know, a consequence that might follow a behavior. 
Leisure's general responses for escape motivated behavior, attention motivated, tangible. And then um, if you are using a behavior plan where you give students points for desired behavior, sometimes you can give them bonus points um, if they went above and beyond. And that's it. So really comprehensive. And you know, in my graduate class, we go over this, we like fill out um, our own fair plans for students that we have in mind. And then we have behavior plans. So there's all types of behavior plans. Now, if the student has a para, it's probably gonna be a lot easier for the para to use the behavior plan. But I mean, I've seen teachers do this in their classroom on their own without the use of a para. And I don't know, you could design something that's really simple that again is based on positive reinforcement. So, I'm not sure if anyone's heard of something called a token economy. So you you give them something desired that they want, that they're working for. Um, I kind of stay away from food. I think like this, this example has gummy bears. I'm working for gummy bears. Like, I don't know, that makes me feel like training an animal. Um, I would pick something, you know, talk to the student, like, what is it that you want to earn? Do you want like a five minute break at the end of the day? Or do you want... Um, you know, do you want time to just play on your clarinet or I don't know, like every kid is different. Um, I've given kids homework passes for, for doing what, you know, doing the behavior that we want them to do. So, so I would say like a token economy is more for younger kids where they get some sort of a point or a star or symbol each time they do a thing they're supposed to do. Um, this is more, this was like a, um, a student with autism who was not doing any written work in his classes because he he has like a very high IQ and just didn't feel like he needed to show his learning because he knows everything, which he wasn't wrong. He has read the entire library. Um, but we knew that he really wanted to be a DJ. And so we kind of tied in earning tokens in his classes for completing work. Um, over the course of four weeks, almost like like turning each token into a money. So one token, I think, was worth $2. After he got up to 112 tokens for completing work in his classes, his parents were like, we will get him this DJ controller. You know? um, and this behavior plan worked like a charm. You know, The function of his behavior was escape from demand. He was just not doing his work. That was his behavior. Once he had something to motivate him, and reinforce the desired behavior, it, it worked. And then after he got the DJ controller, he had developed work habits that were automatic. And so he didn't need the plan anymore. That was awesome. Um, yeah, and here are just some other examples of like, this one kid really loved playing this um, card game called Skibo. Um, so, you know, if he did what he was supposed to do, he'd get points and they would add up at the end of the week and then we'd get to play a game. Uh, There's also something called reflection sheets. So it depends on the student's level of awareness and understanding and what the behavior is. But at the end of the day or during lunchtime, they can reflect on their behavior using one of these sheets. Um, you know, you can take a look at it on the screen, but sometimes students are like, I didn't do anything wrong. I didn't, I didn't hurt anyone. I didn't you know, what I did was justified. So they require adult support with them after school to kind of like talk through and reflect the choice that they made um, and how they're, what they're gonna do next time or how they're gonna repair whatever relationship they may have damaged based on their behavior. And, you know, and then you can sign off or have parents sign off on it. Here's another example of a reflection sheet. They're calling the behavior a choice. What choice did I make today? Why did I do that? Next time I feel this way, I can, you know, here are some, I, I think for this student, I turned it into a multiple choice. So um, he didn't have to come up with his own ideas. Um, in the chat. 
Oh no, uh, Suzanne says she's done the reflection sheet and one of the teachers pushed against it. Did you find, Suzanne, did you find the reflection sheet helpful? Did it like, did it work? Was the student able to reflect after the fact and adjust their behavior? <laughs> And while Suzanne's um, responding to that, I'm just gonna, oh, somewhat, but not sure if it was worth it. I mean, sometimes you have to, like a lot of these, any of these interventions, like when you get these slides and you click on the links and stuff, you have to give them a, like extra tries. Like they, sometimes things don't work right away and you just have to try them a few times before seeing if they work. So I've done reflection sheets with students like five or six times and like no matter what it didn't it didn't matter that was not the right course of action for that student um so i don't know maybe your ela teacher had a reason for pushing against it or I, maybe you need to try it a few more times um okay so looking at the time really quick behavior contracts are another strategy where you kind of draft up you know what the student how the student is behaving and what they're going to do next time instead and they sign they sign off on it um so let's see yeah this this one was for a student who like kind of just took way too many breaks from the classroom like just left all the time so she kind of helped me we worked on it together actually and um deciding on what kinds of breaks she could take based on how she was feeling and then she signed it and I signed it. And then if she was struggling, I'd hold up the contract and say, hey, remember you signed this, you agreed. Remember, you're gonna try this. And that sometimes it works really well with students. Um, okay, thank you, Rhoda. Um, just really quickly, like here's some other <clears throat> very short contracts. You know, here are the behaviors we want the student to do. Follow the directions, accept help use a calm, quiet voice. Here's the plan. If these behaviors do not happen, you will be given one warning. So this way the student knows what's coming. They're not surprised by it. If the behaviors continue, we'll be told to leave the classroom and take a five minute quiet break in the red chair in 314. We'll be told, you know, time and missed work will be made up after school or during lunch and recess. So that last part is negative punishment. Um, but all these other things beforehand are supports or, you know, um, they're, these are more supports. I wouldn't say that they're positive reinforcement. I think positive reinforcement was happening in addition to this contract. Um, okay, so I wanna get to this emotion piece and then this will be our last slide. Okay. So if you are seeing students exhibit challenging behavior, you really need to try to determine from your gut, is this an anxiety-based response or is this coming from some sort of, is it a behavior, is it a choice? Um, is it like a learned behavior? So you should know that like all the strategies I showed you are not going to work with emotionally-based behaviors. <laughs> So things that we can do for students who have anxiety-based behaviors, try to validate and understand their feelings, try to determine the source. Usually they just don't have, um, usually they don't know, they don't have coping skills. They don't know how to manage their anxiety. They don't know what strategies they can, they can use. Um, sometimes a strategy is just like going for a walk, change of scenery, taking a break somewhere else, you know, listening to music is a huge coping skill for anxiety related behaviors. Students should be getting some form of therapy. They need to learn how to practice, how to express their feelings, but in a respectful way. Um, try to, maybe they need a space to sit with their feelings and let them kind of wash over them. There's also social stories, which I don't have time to go into, 
and just know that people do not have complete control over their emotions, right? Like none of us do. So we can't consecrate them for having feelings. What that means is if we use some sort of like consequence where um, we're ignoring behavior or something like that, <clears throat> that might make them feel worse. Or if we do negative punishment, like that's gonna make them feel so much worse because they don't have control over how they're acting. What they need is to learn coping skills and strategies and how to communicate their feelings. Oh, great. Rhoda's gonna talk about social stories tomorrow. So for behaviors, like we talked about, behavior plans, contracts, reflection sheets are all consequences and strategies you can use. You can invite your student to be part of designing the plan or contract. That's huge because then they have some ownership over it. Directly teach the underdeveloped skill or model appropriate behavior. Like, oh, I'm so stressed right now. I'm gonna communicate about blah, 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 instead of freaking out and ripping up my paper. Um, teach replacement behaviors. So instead of getting up out of your seat, ask for a break. Like that's, that's the behavior you want. <laughs> um, sometimes I have students make up missed time for being off task. That's negative punishment. I haven't done that in a very long time because it doesn't really, it's not very effective. And above all else, whatever you decide to do, be consistent, give it time. If you say you're gonna do a thing, follow through. Cause then if you don't follow through, your students will not trust you have expected and predictable consequences. So like, look, this is a warning. You know, if it happens again, you, you know what's gonna happen, like, cause we've talked about it. It's predictable and expected. And then try to live in the world of positive reinforcement where you're noticing the desired behavior that you want and you're reinforcing it with praise or you're using some sort of point system. And remember that there's an element of choice with behaviors. So we can have some sort of consequence for challenging behavior. Okay, and that is it. Oh, you're muted. I wanna thank Vicki for her time with us today. This was extremely informative and really, really helpful. I know that the folks who are here now have gotten a lot out of it. And I know that the folks who will watch the video will as well. We are, because we did all our logistics up front, we are all set for the first session of the day. This afternoon, um, starting at one o'clock Eastern time until four o'clock, we will have first Krista Yadro, who will be working with music learning theory. And then I'll be doing a session on special education strategies applied to music education, including social stories, which is something that Vicki mentioned today. This is not our last time with Vicky. We get Vicky next week, next session, sorry, which is two weeks from now. Boy, my sense of time today is not what it needs to be. Next session, she will be um, helping us with project feedback. So thank you all very, very much. Have a fabulous little bit. I will see some of you back at one o'clock um, and the rest of you hopefully in two weeks. Thanks everyone and thanks to Vicky. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, everybody.